Hello everyone, Clint Lee here, research analyst for the Bauman Letter, along with Ted Bauman, editor of the Bauman Letter. And today we have this week's edition of Your Money Matters. And what a week it has been for the markets. We're recording this on a, on a Friday. Uh, we know this week that all three major stock market indexes tipped into bear market territory. Uh, that's defined as a 20% decline from the highs. Uh, this officially ends the bull market that commenced back in March of 2009. Uh, so right around the 11th anniversary, uh, we just celebrated that bull market is now officially gone. Uh, but what stands out about this bear market is the speed with which it set in. It only took us 16 trading days on the S&P 500 to reach that bear market threshold. Uh, just to put that into context, the next quickest bear market, you have to go back to 1929, and even then it took 30 days to reach that bear market threshold. Uh, and now that we're in this bear market, a lot of people are thinking back to the last bear market we had that was during the credit crisis. During that time, it actually took 188 days, believe that or not, it, it feels a lot, lot worse than, than, uh, than bringing that point up, but it still took 188 days to reach that bear market threshold. Now, I do wanna show you a chart here because everyone's thinking about the credit crisis now that we're in this new bear market, going back to, to our last instance, um, but not all bear markets are created equally. And I'll show you a chart here to, to bring up what I mean. There are structural bear markets uh, that have things to do with more of the, the credit market backdrop, asset bubbles. That's what we saw during the, the last uh, bear market. You know, that's why that bear market was, was so severe and so drawn out is that these structural events tend to be the worst. Then you also have cyclical bear markets. Those are more driven by the regular business cycle, you know, with what the Fed is doing, if, if they're increasing interest rates, if corporate, corporate profits are on the decline. Uh, but then there's also event-driven bear markets. And that's what this most recent pullback seems to, to meet this definition of an event-driven bear market. Um, and I will look to you, Ted, and ask you the question of, you know, where, where does this stand in terms of being an event-driven bear market? How does this compare to maybe prior instances we've seen? And, and could it give way to, to something that might be worse? Thanks, Clint. Um, I think event-driven bear markets, you know, they're, they're typically associated with things like um, uh, military conflict like the Gulf Wars. Um, they're often sometimes associated with, with disease. We saw them with SARS. Uh, we've seen them before. Uh, but the big difference here this time for me is the uncertainty associated with this particular event. Um, even though it is a virus like uh, other viruses in the past, nobody really knows how fast it's, it's going to continue to spread. We don't know how uh, well governments are going to be able to respond. We don't know if they can uh, control it. We don't know which countries are going to shut down their borders. We don't know the impact on the economy, et cetera, et cetera. So as we know, markets dislike uncertainty more than anything else. So to my mind, this is a qualitatively different kind of event-driven uh, downturn. So, and that's probably why it's so fast, uh, not only because um, we have a, a different structure in the market with computerized trading and all of that, but also just because it's the uncertainty. Um, like, in, in a conflict, like an armed conflict, you know, I mean, like the United States goes into Iraq, they, they defeat Iraq, it's all over, things go back to normal. This is not like that. But for me, the big question is how fragile is the underlying uh, credit system and the financial system? Uh, because I think event-driven uh, markets or, or bear markets can turn into structural bear markets if something, uh, you know, if there's something weak in the financial system. And in that respect, what concerns me, as I've explained several times in, in, in various ways, is the uh, corporate junk uh, bond market, not just here in the U.S., but in, in uh, uh, the Eurozone as well, and particularly the energy sector. There are a lot of companies that essentially will not be able to pay their loans very soon uh, because of what's going on. And the big question is, who holds those loans? Who have they sold them on to? Uh, in other words, cause, you know, because big banks, they make these loans to these companies and they then chop them up into securities and they sell them and they swap them. Uh, and uh, something I've recently learned is that a lot of big U.S. banks have been, uh, they've been going to the Fed, to the repo market to, to uh, extend loan facilities to these companies, but they've been refinancing that money through the Eurozone because in the Eurozone, you can borrow money at a negative interest rate, which means that effectively both sides of the Atlantic are now exposed to the same risk, just like in the 2008 crisis. So, uh, you know, it all depends. If this crisis triggers uh, 
a sort of a mousetrap in the financial system, then it could morph into a structural crisis? Yeah, I mean, what, what you said there, I mean, that, that certainly has some echoes of the last structural credit crisis being back in 2008. Um, you know, it was the, the housing market that ended up springing the trap on, on a lot of different uh, debt issuances, credit default swaps that are being written that caused uh, a lot of losses for a lot of financial institutions uh, that ultimately needed bailed out. So, yeah, as we showed before, if, if this stays a purely event-driven mark, uh, bear market decline, that tends to be the best case scenario in terms of the shallowest decline and the, the, the shortest amount of time and a relatively quick recovery. Uh, but we'll have to monitor for if this turns into something a little bit more structural, triggering perhaps you know, something that we've seen in, in the junk bond market, like you said, uh, especially within the energy sector, because the energy sector uh, it's under a lot of pressure right this week with what's happened uh, with, with OPEC and, and Russia and their announcement this past weekend. That's right. Absolutely. And I think that's a one two blow that the markets weren't expecting. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the big question is, uh, you know, what's been causing these big swings and, and how should we interpret those swings? Yeah, so you talk about the big swings. I know this week uh, we triggered circuit breakers twice. Uh, a circuit breaker is just a temporary pause, about 15 minutes. Uh, where trading is halted, uh, supposedly will let cooler heads prevail to try to avert a market panic. Uh, we, it's triggered, the first level is triggered by a 7% decline, and we hit those levels twice this week. Uh, I don't think we've hit those level. we've hit a circuit breaker since 1997. We ended up triggering them twice this week. And so now the thought process becomes trying to time that bottom. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there right now thinking about we're seeing all this fear, this capitulation is a bottom in. Can I, can I buy a bottom? Especially this morning. Uh, once again, it's being Friday. We, we woke up and saw that futures uh, for stock indexes were bid up about 5%. The indexes opened up about 5%. Uh, then throughout the morning, quickly gave back all those gains. Um, we need to be wary about this sort of price action, don't we? Well, absolutely. And, and in fact, uh, you know, my take, as soon as I saw this happening, was that this is what some people call a dead cat bounce. Um, basically, what they say is that, uh, you know, any cat, uh, even a dead cat will bounce if you drop it from high enough. And Lord knows we saw a big drop, you know, from the, the highs that we had on uh, February 19th. Uh, I want to show you a chart here, though, um, which goes back to the 2008-9 uh, crisis. Now, uh, this chart shows the, uh, the trend line, basically, for the S&P 500. Uh, and what you'll see is that there was a big drop uh, from the beginning of October. There had been a continuous decline before that, but uh, the market dropped. And then there were a couple of, of rapid bounce backs. And some of those bounce backs were around the 7% percent range. If you look in that uh, rectangle, you can see that there were a couple of days when you know, markets bounced back strongly. But if you go from the, the peak of those bounce backs down to the very bottom of the market on March 9th, you're looking at, at almost a 25% drop from that, uh, that attempted comeback, the dead cat bounce. So the reason why I think that's important is that you know, we could be experiencing the same thing. And it's very important for investors to wait for any recovery in the market to be confirmed. In other words, we want to see that there's going to be um, another couple of days worth of recovery, and we want to see higher volumes on the buying side. We don't want to just do this on the basis of one day. Um, if the markets still have further to fall, then obviously this is not the bottom, and no, now is not the time to buy. So uh, I think what we saw this morning was a dead cat bounce, which frankly didn't bounce very high. Yeah, and it's, you, know, you have to be wary about this because you know, some of the strongest days actually in, in the history of the S&P 500 have occurred uh, right in the middle of a bear market decline. Uh, you mentioned the chart earlier showing the, the dead cat bounce and the, the attempt at a rally uh, in 2008. Well, I think if you look at the largest one day gains in history uh, of the top five or six, two of those have taken place, took place back in the 2008 financial crisis. So yeah, it's important to look beyond you know, what the market's doing in, in just a one day period uh, and start to look for other clues. You know, some of the things I, I like to look for in trying to ascertain if a, a true bottom has been put in, uh, you mentioned sort of that volume follow through. Uh, that's that's one, one big item to, to pay attention to. If the market can continue to rally on, on surging volume, that's a good indicator that institutional investors are, are stepping in to buy. 
Uh, I also look to, like to look at what advancing stocks are doing relative to declining stocks. Uh, one of the ratios I'll pay attention there is I would like to see nine or 10 advancing stocks for every declining stock uh, on a strong up day. You know, that, that tells me participation is really good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what we want to see. And, and, and I think the big concern is I'm, I haven't seen the figures for today. Obviously, the trading is still going on as we record this, but it'll be interesting to see whether that's the case. My suspicion is that it won't be because what's changed? I mean, the fundamentals have not changed. Um, yes, the government has announced a couple of steps today. Uh, looks like we're going to be uh, having a national emergency announcement later today. Uh, it looks like there will probably be uh, an additional stimulus package. There's a new uh, testing procedure that's coming out that's going to be faster. But again, the markets don't know how, how well this is going to work. Um, and right now, I don't think investors are, are in a position or, or, or likely to want to pile back into stocks without knowing with certainty where things are going. Yeah, but that doesn't mean they should be doing nothing at this point, right? I guess, you know, as you're waiting to see these signs for a bottom, one of the things you can be doing right now is, is putting together that shopping list, putting together that shopping list of, of stocks, sectors, you know, ETFs, whatever it is uh, that you would like to own. Uh, and I guess along those lines, is there anything that stands out to you, Ted, that you would be looking for you know, at this point in time that would be an attractive opportunity? Well, Clint, funny you should ask. In fact, I do have some ideas on that front. And I think uh, w the more I think about it, the more I think this is a really, really good idea uh, for a number of reasons. I like the real estate investment trust sector, uh, not as a whole. I think it's important to drill down to specific subsectors uh, that have particular strength. But in a nutshell, real estate investment trusts are all about investing in property. And of course, uh, they're mainly commercial properties that generate rental income and other kinds of income. Um, so they're backed by solid assets. But one of the critical things about the real estate investment trust sector, besides the fact that it pays really good dividends over time, uh, is that it is financially much stronger than the rest of the, uh, the, the corporate sector in general in terms of its uh, debt and cash position and also that it has learned the lessons from 2008, unlike many other sectors. So let me show you a chart. Um, this shows a, a sort of a balance sheet analysis of the REIT sector as a whole in the US. And what you see there is the red line shows that the interest expense um, as a percentage of net operating income has actually declined very, very strongly since 2008 during the crisis, because these companies have learned not to overload themselves with debt because they know what happens, that if, you, if, if the economy tanks, uh, if, if funding markets seize up, um, that that poses a real danger to them. Um, on the other hand, most of these companies have also uh, shifted the approach to financing so that they're taking longer term loans, which means that they're not forced to cough up a lot of money very quickly when they're making these, uh, you know, when they're paying back these loans. So, I like the REIT sector because it's financially stronger than most other companies in the U.S. economy right now. But the other reason is that, yes, their stock prices are declining like everybody else's. But in the REIT sector, that's good for us because we want to buy those companies at the lowest possible price. Because when the economy does recover, the dividend payments that they're making are going to be huge relative to the price that we paid for them. So for example, if you uh, buy a, a, a stock right now that's paying a 5% dividend and its price, uh, you know, its price declines, let's say by 50% uh, and you buy it uh, when it's at that low price, you can easily get a 10% dividend on your cost that you paid for that company uh, in, in years to come, which is outstanding. So if you are a retirement investor, if you're looking for a way to generate income for yourself, I would be looking at REITs. And in fact, we have one coming up in the Bauman letter, the, uh, the, the current issue. And that's precisely why we target it, because this is the play to be making right now. It's perfectly in line with the situation. Uh, it's designed to take advantage of what happens when you get a downturn like this. So that's my recommendation. Look to REITs. And our subscribers to the Bowman Letter are, are certainly no stranger to REITs. We hold several uh, among our portfolio holdings. Uh, but just one other thing as well. I mean, when, when you are putting this sort of shopping list together, and you're wanting to, to secure a good yield, uh, it's really important to, to look underneath the hood and understand uh, whether it's a REIT or any other type of company, the, the long-term prospects, uh, understanding the health of the balance sheet, because 
with this decline in the market, there are a lot of companies now, uh, especially in the energy sector, that are sporting incredibly high yields when you look at trailing dividends. Uh, but because of the outlook, you know, especially for companies in the energy sector, you know, they're likely to have to, to slash those dividends uh, to try to save money to, to try to weather the storm. So you know, obviously that, that's something that we're doing with our own holdings and understanding you know, what the growth catalyst is, the ability to sustain that dividend and grow that dividend uh, over time. And, and that's important to achieving that higher yield on cost that you just mentioned. Well, absolutely. And that's why I said it's important not to just look at REITs as a whole, but to look at specific ones. So I'm recommending REITs, but what I recommend even more strongly is follow somebody like us uh, that specializes in understanding the opportunities there. Because what we're doing is looking for uh, REITs that operate in sectors that uh, are not vulnerable to the kinds of stresses that we're seeing in the economy right now. Uh, just as an example, I would be wary uh, of REITs in the retail uh, sector that, that you know, rent out retail premises simply because uh, people are not going to be going to the stores. Um, we're going to see a decline in operating income from those stores, which means that their ability to pay their rents to the REITs that own those stores is going to decline. So we look for REITs that are not exposed to that kind of danger, and that's precisely what we've done in this month's Balma Motor. All right, well, we'll wrap that up uh, for this week for Your Money Matters. Be sure to check back in frequently as we will be posting our thoughts, whether in Your Money Matters or in our written commentaries as well, as things continue to unfold, as developments continue uh, to come across on the coronavirus outbreak, the impact that it's having on the economy and the markets as well. This is Clint Lee and Ted Bauman. Thanks for joining us.